So, so there's a question that's been in my mind for quite a long time. I'd say about nine years. And the question is the following. Do we have to follow up on news of conflict around the world? Do we have to follow up on news of conflict around the world? Now, I see a lot of blank faces, and I'm right there with you. I mean, I've been thinking about this for nine years, and I kind of still don't get it. I mean, yeah, I'm 19 now, so I was thinking about this when I was 10. I guess I was a little boy with big <laughs> ideas or thinking about big things. It was the cool thing to do in middle school. Um, but yeah, I think about this every day. I'm an international relations major, and all my professors ask and inquire and insist that we read the newspaper every day and know what's happening around the world. And from that context, that makes a lot of sense. And also, as a philosophy major, I'm really interested in my relationship with that newspaper, with that news, news source. Is it a required reading? Is it an assigned assignment? Or is it something more? Is it an ethical obligation? And I, and I still remember when I first started thinking about the question. It was nine years ago. It was July 12, 2006. It was a nice, warm day in a Lebanese village called Betloun in Mount Lebanon. Now, I'm from Lebanon. It's a small country in the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> it's a small country in the Middle East, smaller than the size of Connecticut, with a population of 4.5 million people. And I was sitting outside on the balcony of our house with my um, two brothers, Omar and Jad, and my sister Karen. And we were planning the summer. It was already July, and we had one more month of, of summer left. We wanted to make the most out of it. And we started planning our summer, and it was going to include lots of biking and hiking and, and, and running around and soccer playing, and it was going to be great. Now, halfway through our planning, my mother comes in, all of a sudden, interrupts us, and she said, a war has been declared in the country. Now, when she said that, I looked at my brother, and he looked at me. And we were psyched. We were excited. We were amazed. This was amazing. War was this glorifying, you know, thing that we've seen, you know, all the glorifying, uh, war-glorifying movies we've watched, all the war-glorifying video games we've played, and this was it. This was the real thing. You know, summer was going to be this adventure of dodging missiles and bullets, and we're going to be heroes. Now, we were naive little 10-year-olds who obviously knew nothing about war, and, and fortunately that summer turned out nothing like we ex expected, at least not for us. And so we spent that summer, just like any other summer, playing around, playing soccer, outside all day, and then coming back home before dinner. And every day it was different depending on the events that we did, but there was one constant during that entire time. And that was every time I came back home, me and my siblings before dinner, and walked into the living room. It was that same setting. My parents and grandparents sitting in front of the TV watching the news. And every day the death toll would increase. 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, 500, 600, 900. And by the end of the 34-day conflict, 1,235 people had been killed. Now that's something that affected me. It affected me deeply, something that kept me up at night and I thought about for a long time. But truthfully, as a 10-year-old, it didn't change the way I went about my life. I didn't, you know, play less and watch more news. I didn't keep up with the news more. And I was wondering, was I doing the right thing? You know, I'm, I'm a 10-year-old. Am I supposed to be inside keeping up with the news, learning about this, or was I doing the right thing? I kind of wanted to know. And at the same time, I thought back to when my mother told us about the news. And she was very calm and confident. And it wasn't because she was trying to look strong or anything. Well, it was because there was almost for her, no reason to, to worry. We've been living a little bit far away from the conflict in Mount Lebanon while the conflict was happening in the south. And knowing my parents' generation had lived through 25 years of civil war uh, from 1975 to 1990, and yet here they were, successful beings. So it seems that despite war and despite all this conflict, our lives continue, and there's a need for the continuation of our life. So I, so I thought, hmm, maybe it's not an obligation because maybe despite the conflict, it doesn't do to dwell on it. Maybe there's a need for us to continue with our lives. There's a need for that continuation. War can exist, but our lives need to continue as well. And that made me comfortable, and I, and I got that position. I, I thought that was it, and I kept that position for two years, well, until I had another encounter with, with conflict, and a distant encounter. And I still remember, it was, it was May 7, 2008. This time I was in Beirut, the capital of Lebanon. I was in my room and I was studying for this math test, and me in seventh grade math just did not get along. I, I, I hated it. <laughs> it wasn't great at all. And I was sitting there studying, trying to solve these problems when my mom comes in all of a sudden, always with the good news, God bless her. And she says, <laughs> she says that a conflict is erupting in Beirut. Now what she was referring to was a seven-day conflict where different um, political parties and religious sects took arms and took to the streets and fought each other. You know, people can be mean sometimes, so that kind of happens. 
And when she said that, I, I thought, hmm, I was back in 2006, two years ago. Conflict happens and our lives continue. It's going to be the same thing. And at least that's how it was for me, again, and for other people, but not for the tens of people killed and the hundreds injured. And this time the conflict was different because it was happening in Beirut where I was living. And so two days after into the conflict, things got really um, messy. Again, people can be really mean. <laughs> they, took to, they took arms and took to the streets and started fighting. And so the conflict started getting closer, and it was outside our apartment, so there was almost no way to go. And our family took the decision to stay in the hallways because that was the safest place from, from, from stray bullets and rocket-propelled grenades. And then there was, elect there was a power outage, so there was no access to electricity, no Internet. And so it was almost a complete isolation from the outside world. And yet, despite, despite that complete isolation from the outside world, the, the only comforting thought was that someone somewhere out there was listening to, to news of people in a similar situation. Despite that disconnect, the only connect with the outside world was, was within a person. It was a person out there following the news, listening, and, and that power was in their hands. So I thought, hmm, if there was one person out there following up the news about a random country in the Middle East, who would it be? And I couldn't pinpoint someone, but I knew who it wasn't, and I knew who it couldn't be, and that was me. Because I was there two years ago when a conflict was happening right in my country, and I, and I came up with this genius idea. You know what? Conflict happens, and, and our lives need to continue, so it doesn't do to dwell on it. And in that moment, I felt uncomfortable. I felt, you know, I, I really don't know the answer to this question. Do we have to follow up with news of conflict? And at the same time, I realized I was only 12, so I was probably not going to find out the answer soon enough. So it stayed in the back of my head for a long time. And it stayed in the back of my head until I met this really cool guy from Athens. Now, unfortunately, he was dead when I, was met, when I met him, but his student had already written down all of his thoughts. So I'm talking about Plato, I mean, you know, Socrates. And I was amazed by what he had to say. I'm, I was amazed by his views on ethics and, and the good life. And but most importantly, I was amazed by, by his paradox, the Socratic paradox. And now what Socrates says is that, you know, we as human beings, our interest, our happiness is achieved by doing what is good. And that made a lot of sense to me. You know, I grew up around people, and all they wanted to do was change the world, impact in the most pos positive way. And that makes us happy, makes us satisfied, makes us content. And Socrates also said that if we know what is good, then we'll act in a way to achieve it. It also makes sense. I thought about all the activists in the world. You know, there's a lot of inequality out there, and we believe that all people should be equal. So we stand up for what is right, knowing that what we are, we are standing for is the right thing. Now, interestingly, interestingly enough, Socrates also says that if we ever do something that's wrong or perhaps not virtuous or mor morally reprehensible, well, that's because we were, you know, trying to do what is good, but we were mistaken about the nature. And so I thought about it, and again, it made sense. I thought about, well, there are a lot of well-intentioned people out there who say, donate money to charities, and that money ends up being used for harmful causes. And so are they responsible? Well, they had good intentions, but sort of. Then on a, on a more familiar reason, I thought, hmm, all the times that I try to do the right things, say the right things, improve situations, and end up messing things up. That kind of makes sense. And as well, on a global scale, think about all the dictators running their countries, thinking that they're, what they're doing is, is correct and it's the right thing, but at the end, their actions and decisions are detrimental and destructive. And so what Socrates says is that because the reason we mess up after going what is good is because we don't actually know the true nature of what is good when we're doing that. And so because of that, he stresses the importance of knowledge. Knowledge is virtue while ignorance is vice. And that's why we need to examine things. We need to know. We need to find out what is good. That's why he states the unexamined life is not worth living. So I thought about that for a while, and then I thought, wait, that's so contradictory to what I'm saying and what I'm studying. If Socrates says that if we know what is good, then we'll do what is good, the history of the human race proves the complete opposite. We know that genocide and killing is, is unethical, and yet it continues to happen, and we haven't done anything significant to stop it. So I thought, and, and another thing that counters my argument is that, you know what, sometimes we know about atrocities taking place, and yet we don't do enough to, to stop them. You know, right now, there's, there, we're being warned of an imminent famine in South Sudan. Uh, minorities are still being persecuted by extremists all over the world. And so after coming to college and taking all these classes, human rights in the media, human rights in the world politics, I thought, hmm, how much do we know about these things happening? And what I found out was that we don't. We don't know a lot about things happening in the non-Western world. And what I realized was that the way the media portrays things in the non-Western world versus the way they portray things in the Western world is completely different. And we noticed this even this year. So at the beginning of this year, there was a great discrepancy and difference between the media covered the events happening in Paris, the attacks on the French satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo, 
versus the coverage of the um, Boko Haram attack on the town of Baga in Nigeria happening at the same time. So on January 3rd, um, and what's interesting about these is that both of these attacks are an attack on the ideal of freedom of expression, an, an ideal that is held very highly in the Western world. And so on, on January 3rd, uh, uh, two Islamic extremists attacked the headquarters of a French newspaper, and that resulted in the death of 17 people. Between January 3rd and January 7th, I mean, yeah, between Jan January 7th, between January 3rd and January 7th, uh, Boko Haram led a massacre in the town of Baga that led to the death of 2,000 people. Yet, the media coverage of these two events is, is incomparable. Uh, media Cloud, a tool devised by um, MIT Center for Civic Media and Harvard's Beckerman Center for Internet and Study, found out that um, media outlets covered the attacks happening in French, 3 .2, published 3.2 more times about the attacks in France than about the attacks in Nigeria. And online media outlets published 10 times more um, news events about the attacks happening in Paris than about in those happening in Nigeria. And that's 2,000 people dead. And so I thought, I thought about this and then I, I realized something, that the international community's response to these events is somewhat reflective of this media coverage. In France, we saw over 40 world leaders marching down in Paris in solidarity with the victims. Over 3.5 million people marching around, Paris, around, around France in solidarity. Yet those world leaders, they weren't there in Nigeria, and the solidarity that we saw, the worldwide solidarity with the victims of Paris, um, with the hashtags and the social media, was incomparable to that happening in Nigeria. And so I thought about this, and then I tried to, you know, find out why is it that that is happening. And so Professor uh, Paul Slovic, who's a uh, professor at the university, professor of psychology at the University of Oregon, says that the physical distance between the U.S. and Nigeria is much greater than the physical, than the, psychologi the psychological distance between the U.S. and France is much smaller than the psychological distance between the U.S. and Nigeria. And so I thought about this, and, and what I thought was, that's really interesting. You know, if the problem is within the psychological distance, then that's both the problem and the solution. If that's the problem, then we know the solution. We know that if we know more about things, then we care more about them. And if we care more about the things, the more willing we are to act. I mean, yes, genocide after genocide, atrocity after atrocity, the international community shouts out, nunca mas, or never again. And yet these things continue to happen. And they continue to happen as a result of our apathy and inaction. But the reason we're, we're apathetic is because we don't care. And the reason we don't care is, well, we don't know. We don't know enough. And there's a whole debate happening in different fields, in academic fields, in the human rights field, about the responsibility to act once you know. You know, whether if I know about a conflict, do I now have a responsibility to do something about it? Well, in my opinion, I think that's jumping too far ahead. Before we talk about the responsibility to act once we know, there need to, we need to make sure that there's universal responsibility everywhere to inquire and to find out about events. You know, um, and because, well, sometimes, um, you know, f it, knowledge is so important because once, only by knowing these things, we can get rid of the apathy that allows them to continue to happen. With knowledge comes sympathy. With sympathy comes solidarity. With solidarity comes action. And we can't even assume for such a solution without a universal inquiry to find out. So at the end of the day, what if we have an ethical obligation to learn about these atrocities and the nature of these atrocities and why they continue to happen? What if we owe it to the people suffering to learn about their suffering? Because today, more than ever, we know what is good. And, and if Socrates is right, we want to be good people. And, and we can't do that without getting out of our way to finding out about what's happening around the world. And now, in no way am I saying that I follow up with all news of conflicts and I know everything that's happening around the world. I don't, and I can't find out, and I'm failing in my responsibility. But I think it's time to acknowledge that responsibility, to accept it, and to work towards it. Because the true company that genius needs is a de desire to know. And at this time and in this era, the company that the world needs is us. Thank you.